Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Pardon. Uh, it is now just after seven o'clock on an incredibly nasty, flooded night in, a, in and around Edinburgh. And it is interesting to see 20 people in the room, which is a, a, quite surprising. And I understand 20 or so online currently at home. And this is almost as much as I need to say, except to thank you very much for all turning up uh, and to hand over to Graham to introduce Tom Dodd, our speaker tonight. Thank you, Mike. Um, again, just repeat, uh, thank you to everybody who's made the effort to come out on such a uh, horrendous night weather-wise. Um, it's my pleasure in a moment to introduce Tom Dodd. Um, I'd like just briefly to say something about the programme coming up uh, over the course of the rest of this winter and into the spring. Um, the new edition, the fifth edition of Geology of Scotland is on its way. And uh, so I've dipped into some of the authorship of the, that volume uh, to uh, come and present, uh, if you like, adverts for their chapter. Uh, but for the volume as a whole. So in two weeks' time, uh, Rob Strachan and Martin Smith, as the editors of the volume, will do a double act. Uh, and I think it's the first time we've had a double act. Um, and they'll introduce the, the, the new volume, the reasons behind it, what's new, what's different about it, why do we need a fifth edition, that sort of thing. So that will be in two weeks' time. And uh, that will be followed up by Martin Crabbendam, uh, who has been one of the key authors on the uh, Neoproterozoic stratigraphy uh, chapter, uh, particularly the Moyne. Uh, and, uh, and then in the, towards Easter, uh, towards the end of the session, Alison Monaghan uh, and our co-authors, I think that will be a team effort. So we may have uh, three or four people on the podium that night. We'll be talking about the Carboniferous uh, chapter as well. Um, so hopefully the volume will appear sometime next year, I guess, just watch this space. Tonight, uh, our speaker is Tom Dodd, uh, I can now say an ex-colleague of mine at BGS, but uh, since I've finally hung up my clogs and retired. Um, but uh, I've worked with Tom in uh, Singapore uh, and in Kuala Lumpur on various aspects of geology in those uh, cities and regions. And uh, so it, it's, it's my pleasure certainly to have Tom and, uh, come and talk to the society tonight about his research uh, and particularly the work that he's now doing uh, in relation to the geology of the Falkland Islands. Um, Tom joined uh, BGS in 2011 from, uh, directly from uh, graduating from Keele University. And old days there used to be an Aberdeen mafia in, in uh, uh, BGS now, I think there's a bit of a keel mafia, to be honest. Um, and Tom was, was one of a number of people who've come from that university uh, in the last 10 years or so. Joined in 2011 as a sedimentologist and worked on various projects uh, since that time. And uh, recently, though, taking over as the project lead or project manager or whatever the term is for uh, the work that BGS does on the... Um, prospects uh, and the geology of the Falkland Islands and BGS has for many years now worked on, on that region. Um, so Tom has gone to bring, you, bring us up to date on uh, the geology of that region. Also uh, dipping into the work that uh, he's using, the, the, the rocks and materials, the research that he, he is doing in his own right to uh, complete his PhD uh, in the process of dealing with all the other issues in Falkland geology that, that uh, BGS has to deal with. So Tom is going to be talking in to, uh, about uh, insights into ancient deep lacustrine rather than deep marine uh, sedimentology. Tom, take it away. Thank you. Okay. Right now you can probably all hear me. 
Great, right. Thank you for all turning up tonight on a horrible rainy night. I certainly saw plenty of puddles driving around trying to get home and back again tonight. So, um, so I definitely appreciate for those of you who've made it tonight. Um, yeah, thank you, Graham. As Graham says, I, um, I have been working for BGS for about 11 years now uh, as a sedimentologist, seismic interpreter on a range of projects, but one of the key projects I've worked on, and I'm still working on it 11 years later, surprise, surprise, is um, on, the, on the Falcon Islands data set. Um, and uh, I've spent a lot of time interpreting seismic from the Falklands, looking at uh, sedimentology from core data, looking at wireline data, full models from the, the, the small scale to the, from the grain scale through to the big scale regional interpretations of the islands. Um, and I could have picked a load of different themes tonight. I could have gone in from the more uh, prospectivity sort of side of things, but I thought that's not, not necessarily what you might want to hear tonight. So I thought, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and convince you that deep lacustrine systems are really interesting, worthwhile things to study. So if any of you come away from this tonight thinking, oh, they're not that interesting, then please come see me after and I'll, I've got plenty more examples of why they're interesting. So I've not done my job tonight, if that's the case. So my title tonight uh, is uh, Insights into Ancient Deep Lacustrine Sedimentary Systems, Turbidite Fans, and Classic Injectite Systems of the North Falkland Basin in the South Atlantic. There's plenty of time to get into the detail of all those words there, but what we're going to be looking at is the sedimentology of deep water uh, fan deposits, and we're also going to look at some of the systems that may connect those systems um, but are, that are post-depositional. And the whole, the whole theme of it, is to explore, uh, why is that not working? There we go. Is to explore uh, the heterogeneity in the subsurface. So um, I'm gonna start off by uh, giving you a background to the basin, so you know where we're talking about. Uh, and that's from the North Falcon Basin. We're gonna, then I'm gonna go over deep lacustrine turbidite fan systems uh, and look at the processes and products that are found within those systems. We have a little bit more of a deep dive into the, the details of some of those processes and look at the uh, deposits that are known as hybrid event beds, um, which are quite a hot topic and have been a hot topic in the last 20 years or so in deep water sedimentology. And as I said a minute ago, we're going to look at some classic injectites that are surrounding in between above and below the, uh, the turbidite fan systems. And I'll conclude. Right. That's enough faffing around. Um, so essentially, we're looking at a basin um, to the north of the Falkland Islands. If none of you know where the Falkland Islands are, they're situated uh, just here, just near the, uh, the eastern coast of uh, South America. And we're going to focus on the North Falkland Basin, which is uh, this area just in here. The Falkland Islands are surrounded by uh, a whole other suite of basins to the south. Um, and these are all uh, Mesozoic basins, but the, the key focus for today's talk is this, this North Falcon Basin, which is a, a north-south trending, um, largely north-south trending rift graben. Uh, there is a, another um, trend running from uh, northwest to southeast through here. But the, the fans that we're going to look at today are from just in this, this margin here that come from the uh, eastern side of the, the basin. The orange polygon is the sea lion fan. Uh, which is one of the, the key fans within the North Falcon Basin. Uh, the, the sea lion fan and its, and its counterpart fans that we're going to look at today in some detail are early Cretaceous age, about Aptian. Um, so it's, it's ancient deep lacustrine systems, not modern. Uh, and so if we zoom in on, on the details of that section, we've got, uh, as I said, north-south trending um, rift system in here with a set of wells. So all of these extremely large uh, dots, which are far larger than the well, obviously, are uh, the, the well, well data that we've got from, from the North Falcon Basin. So there's, there's, there's not a huge amount of wells. If you compare the wells to the, the wells in the, the North Sea, it doesn't even register at all. Um, it's, there's 30, 35 wells or so. Um, but what those wells have done, have actually, they've managed to uh, intersect a whole suite of really interesting depositional systems. And the, the, the hydrocarbon exploration wells, um, there's no getting away from that. But um, essentially, those deep lacustrine systems form the reservoirs. And those reservoirs need to be characterized. And that's where my interest comes in, because characterizing these systems from a sedimentological perspective, the science behind it all, 
it, uh, that's the key theme um, that I like to try and, I've been researching for 10 years or so, but I'd like to continue doing so um, in the future. And there is a reason for that. And it's because uh, deep water systems, so deep water systems globally, and I'm talking about um, deep marine systems mainly, have been researched, the, have been key research themes for the last, let's say 40, 50 years, however long you want to, however long you want to extend back. And they form the key reservoirs worldwide within, within basins. But deep lacustrine systems um, have only more recently been a focus for hydrocarbon exploration. And we don't understand quite as much about the, the basins themselves in the deep lacustrine setting as we do about the deep marine setting. So all of the autogenic and allergenic controls on the processes and products that we find in deep marine systems are well known. And we've got some nice data from the Falkland Islands um, that we've been exploring the, the products and processes in those basins in some detail. Globally, there's other basins worldwide. So looking out in China, Thailand, um, some extent in, in, the, in the US where there are deep lacustrine systems. Um, but the, the processes and products really haven't been well understood over the last 20 years. And th there may be um, really quite contrasting controls between the, the two settings. Uh, in the marine setting, you've got sea level, which tends to control all of the sequence stratigraphical surfaces at the broad scale. Whereas in the deep lacustrine setting, it's climate um, and, and is, is one of the key controls on, on lake water level, whereas there's no relative sea level change that controls those systems and it's completely disconnected from the marine realm. So there's, a, there's different relationships between climate um, in the deep lacustrine setting that might cause different geometries and um, different deposits in the deep lacustrine turbidite fan systems that I'm going to show you today. So I guess the key theme and the question I want you to keep in your head is, um, are the key differences in deep lacustrine systems? Uh, are they the same as deep marine systems? What, what things can we explore and observe in the subsurface data that we're going to look at? So just to zone in now, so this is the 1410-2 well here, which is the discovery well for sea lion. Um, the, the sea lion discovery was made in, in this part of the stratigraphy in here, which is the early, uh, uh, the early post drift uh, Aptian sequence. And this is, the, this is the key interval that we're gonna be looking at today. And all of the examples in this talk today are from, from this part of the stratigraphy. Um, the, as I said, the fans are uh, sourced from the Eastern margin. So this is the Eastern margin of the North Falkland Basin. Uh, so this, this set of faults is essentially this, this North South trending fault system that runs through here. And uh, basically, we're going to look at how the fan varies spatially and temporally within that, that sequence of stratigraphy. So let's get into look at some of the nice images that I've got to show you. Uh, we've, this, is the, this is a surface. This, this is a seismic surface. Um, it's, uh, it's a two-way time surface. So essentially, it's, it's an image of the, 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 the offshore areas below seabed down at about 2,500 meters subsea. Uh, and essentially, the, the, the surface is a regional sequence stratigraphical surface. It's a low stand in, in, the, in, the deep, in the deep lake. We know it's a deep lake because in, those, in that well data, um, the biostratigraphy tells us it's a deep lake. The, the microfossils uh, tell us that uh, it's not a marine assemblage. It's, it's more of a, a freshwater lacustrine assemblage. So we're pretty certain this is a deep lake setting. Uh, and during this time, this is this is probably around the Aptian, um, probably ap early Aptian through to Aptian um, succession. You've got a set of fans that come in from the eastern margin. So this is the sea lion north fan, this um, black uh, and white sort of area. Uh, this this fan system in here, which sort of follows that sort of trend. Uh, and to the south of that, the sea lion fan. And I've colored up the sea lion fan in this example just to try and um, help you understand the rest of the images that we're going to see today. Essentially, um, essentially, what we've got here is a two-way time map, but on top of that, we've draped seismic amplitudes in plan form. So it says seismic amplitude, high to low. Uh, essentially, if you've got a, si a high seismic amplitude uh, in, these, in this area, it just broadly um, corresponds to uh, more sand-rich areas. Whereas the, the lows, so the, the whites in this particular example, 
are the uh, more mud rich areas. So we're, we're talking about mapping broad, thick packages of sand in the subsurface. And you'll get, you'll get the hang of it as we go through. So, probably all uh, completely confused you now, but there is uh, some lovely maps to look at uh, in this section. So we're going to zoom in on the sea lion fan, which was that yellowy uh, brown sort of set of polygons I showed you a minute ago. The sea lion fan is composed of uh, three lobes, uh, so SL10, SL20, and SL15. Uh, just going from uh, south to north, but they are in um, stratigraphic order. So SL20 is the uh, oldest, followed by SL15, and then followed by SL10. And these, these, uh, these fans in the seismic data, if you look at them in cross-sectional view, which is this image in here, they're essentially one seismic uh, event thick. So if you follow the uh, cursor through here, that is one of these lobes. And overlapping that on top of it is another lobe. And so they really are at the limits of the seismic resolution. Uh, in this area, at this depth, the seismic resolution limit is 12 and a half meters for uh, an individual feature. But uh, if you want a top and base, you're looking at around 25 meters in thickness. So these fans are at that resolution, at that thickness. So they really are at the limits of the seismic resolution. And so you get these tabular features in cross-sectional view. And so you can't really, in, in the cross-sectional view, see any channelization within the fan systems. But when you map them out and you, you sit there picking for hours on end, trying to constrain the lateral distribution of the fan system, and then plot all of those seismic amplitudes in plan form view, so rather than cross-sectional view, you see that there are some absolutely lovely uh, seismic arch architectures um, within, the, within the, uh, the, the pick. And I showed you in the first instance a, a plot of seismic amplitude with gray and white. This now is colored up in some brighter colors just to extenuate that. But essentially the same thing, same principle, the, the bright colors, the the reds and the greens correspond to more sand rich areas and the blues and the whites correspond to uh, more mud rich areas. So broadly, uh, these, these, these seismic architectures uh, probably reflect, uh, well, we know that they do, but the, at this point, the, the seismic architectures correspond to more sand rich areas, correspond to actual geology. So it, we're going from geophysics into geology now. The, the amplitude response is stronger where you've likely got more sand rich areas, where the thicker sands or higher quality sands. Um, and these areas are where it starts to shingle out laterally into more mud prone facies. So we've, I've sat there and I've interpreted these, these amplitudes in quite some detail, spending a considerable amount of time looking at them, thinking about the geometries and what that might relate within the overall turbidite fan system itself. And if you color that up in a, in a nice uh, uh, image just here, it, it, I, this is my interpretation of that, that one particular lobe within sea lion with these sand rich, uh, what I call lobe axis deposits um, in, in, in the central axial part of the fan. And as they grade laterally outwards, they, they transition into lobe fringe deposits. And as you move away from the main flow corridor, they become uh, lobe distal fringe facies associations. So essentially what you're doing is you're going from the feeder channel at the, at the eastern margin and transitioning both from uh, proximal to distal, but also from uh, axial to lateral um, positions within the fan. It's quite a dynamic environment. And then the nice thing about this is we've got lots of nice well data from these beautiful features. So we've got well data from, from the distal part of the system here in the 1415-4A well. We've got some from slightly more medial location, but quite axial location and this lovely, this lovely uh, sort of linear to gently sinuous feature just in here. Um, when we come into the proximal areas, um, there's no call from this well, but this one we do have some information about the uh, the uh, the lobe fringe, lobe distal fringe facies in the proximal part of the system. 
So we can start to reconstruct the, the fan in terms of sedimentary facies, depositional processes, and, and, and use that information to uh, predict likely reservoir quality across that one lobe system. Surprise, surprise. It is uh, more complicated than just one lobe. So as I said, the sea lion fan's got three uh, depositional lobes. Uh, this is the sea lion 20 lobe. And, and as you can see, when you map it out as just one lobe, you get these lovely plan form uh, seismic architectures uh, at some so gently to quite sinuous, uh, what I call lobe axis uh, deposits coming down the fan system, feeding these really enig enigmatic uh, distal terminal mouth lobe features. Some people in the literature refer to these as uh, uh, terminal splays, if you follow Brian Cronin's nomenclature. Um, but essentially, uh, it, everything that you see in that seismic response looks like geology. It looks like sedimentary systems that you would expect to see. The, 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 the seismic is uh, responding to variation in sedimentary facies in, 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 in space. Uh, so essentially, we've also got some uh, well penetrations through this lobe from different parts of the fan. We, we, we've got core from this, this part in here. We've got core from the more medial parts of the system and all from, also from more distal locations. So using that, plus the stuff from the sea lion 10 lobe, we can start to build up a picture of uh, the, 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 the fan systems and understand how these systems are distributed in space. So this is the final lobe sea lion, um, which is sea lion 15. Uh, if we're starting to think about that, we're starting to believe that these amplitudes actually are corresponding to uh, sedimentary processes. We can see that the, the, the bright amplitudes in here, they, they start off coming in at this, this strike through here. And as they approach the older sea lion north fan that I showed you in an earlier cartoon, uh, they take quite a sharp divergence into more of a, a sort of southwest northeast striking orientation. So you can see how the amplitudes themselves uh, are responding to other uh, features on the, sea, on the lake bed. Uh, you can see that they're brighter in this area in here, and that might result from uh, ponding of the, the fan system along the, the edge of that of the sea lion north fan. We've got core from these locations, again, from quite um, uh, lobe fringe areas in the medial part of the, the lobe. And so that provides more information that we use to reconstruct our facies models. And I, I've put those three together uh, to produce uh, quite a detailed uh, FASI's model for deep Lacustrine fan systems. I've just put this figure in just to highlight the, the level of information we've got from them. And I, because I was obviously just skirting around that we've got core from this place and we've got core from this place, but actually it's, it's quite a well intersected system. So the yellow is SL20, the, uh, the uh, I guess, greeny color is SL15, and the, the orange is SL10. They're the lobes. The black uh, panels these panels in here are core. So this is the, these are the sections that we've got really nice, excellent core quality, um, core from, from core data from those, uh, those, in, those intervals. So it's really is a well intersected system. Uh, there's about 450 meters of core in total through it. So you can really get a good handle on, on, on the, on the, the sedimentology that we're going to talk about in later in some detail for the, for some other fan systems. Now I'll get onto that in a minute, but we've, I've been to the, the core stores. I've spent time logging it. I've logged it in quite a bit of detail, one to 10 centimeter scale, which I now realize was overkill, but the data set is there. So this is quite a simplified um, correlation panel between the different uh, lobes. Um, but because we've got uh, different lobes intersected in different places, but not all places intersected and not all lobes that have been drilled have been cored, we had to, sort, had to sort of stitch it all together and try and understand the system based on the examples that I'd got from different lobes. And through that, and through all that logging, we were able, I was able to uh, come up with an idealized set of facies associations from the deep Lacustrine systems, which relate back to those uh, interpretations of seismic amplitude that I was showing you. So the lobe axis facies association, the the seismically bright areas within those fans are composed of quite sand-rich deposits. Uh, so they're, they're usually structureless sands, 
Uh, sometimes they've got dish structures in them, which are indicative of dewatering processes. They've got quite sharp bases, which are uh, sometimes erosional, um, but mostly loaded. Uh, there's some lovely load cast structures at the base of those hands. In mostly in most places, they're amalgamated, so they're they're composed of more than uh, two slash three uh, bed beds bed deposits. So it forms like a stack succession of of, of clean, well sorted, structureless sands. Some of them show normal grading at the top, uh, probably relating to a, a decelerating flow. Uh, and with rafted mud clasts toward the, the tops of the units, uh, indicating the top of a traction carpet. So the, the, the fans are constructed, the, the seismically bright areas are constructed from high density turbidite flows. The, the, the turbidite flow, uh, for those of you who don't, aren't into this um, terminology, essentially turbidite flow is a, a flow uh, of mixture between water and sediment that enters a, a basin. So it's, it's a subaqueous, it's below, below the sea surface or below the lake surface in this case. Uh, and essentially the, the density contrast between the, the flow entering the basin and the water within the basin uh, sets up turbidity within that flow and that uh, allows that flow to flow out into distal parts of the basin. That's the broad, that's the broad uh, world of turbidite sedimentology, but actually there's a whole raft of different uh, subtypes of subaqueous sediment gravity flows ranging from the turbidite. So the true turbidite where you've got turbidity and, and uh, that would probably be more uh, generally be associated with low density turbidity currents. Uh, and then through to other flow types like debris flows, debrites, where you've got high concentrations of typically mud, which travel out onto the sea floor. So there's a whole spectrum of different flow types, but we're dealing with high density turbidites in this example. As we step out laterally from the main flow axis, those flows um, become less energetic, uh, uh, less regular, and there's more um, breaks and sedimentation in between the flows. And so you get finer grain deposits, uh, which uh, show more structures in terms of low density structures like parallel lamination and ripple cross lamination. The beds are more isolated and, in, and separated by um, parallel laminated mudstones in between. And these, are, these aren't as stacked and amalgamated as the, the high density deposits uh, to the, in the more proximal areas. And again, as you step out laterally from there, you go to even finer, thinner beds, uh, which are separated again by parallel laminated mudstones. So it's that gradual transition from the, the axial part of the fan where you've got stacked um, amalgamated event beds. And as you step laterally and distally, those transition into these, these lower density flow types. So mainly high density flows going through to low density flows as the flows dissipate and lose energy and deposit their sediment. Uh, and the, the, those are, those are intervened. The, the, the intervening deposits between those flow types are the hemi-limnic mudstone facies associations, um, mainly parallel laminated mudstones. And that, those deposits are particularly interesting within their own right. They, they really do uh, provide a, a tape recorder almost to um, climate change within the lake environment. So that's a, that's a whole other uh, tangent to go down. But these systems are really, really interesting from the, the from the coarse grain deposits through to the more mud prone deposits. And then, as with anything, there's there's instances where you find quite contorted facies. So you I, I, we call these deformed sandstone and mudstone facies associations, but these essentially represent things from from debrites through to um, a collapse of channel levees through to lots of different. Um, processes and because we haven't got that much information from those from the core data it's it's more of a bucket facies um association in this in the system and then the hybrid event bed which is the the, the fun one um so hybrid event beds uh they are essentially similar to uh, a high density turbidite at the base but they have quite a clay rich top and essentially they're, they're a complex um, deposit that's formed through uh, a flow which shows both turbidity and debritic character. So the, the base uh, is deposited by the high density turbidity current as it flows out. Might be still quite a high concentration flow, quite sand rich, but it's, it's a high density turbidity current. And as, as that 
flow flows out, it sorts all the material, um, all the fine grain material, the muds, the carbonaceous fragments, the, the, the yeah, mainly, mainly the muds, it sorts them towards the top and rear part of the flow. And at, at, at a point, they, the two can't coexist and they actually um, segregate into two flows. So a, a forerunning turbidity current and a debris flow that sits just behind it. And they're quite a complex deposit. And the reason why people are really so interested in them is because for the high density turb turbidites in a reservoir, it's sand on sand. Uh, there might be some changes in porosity and permeability at the amalgamation surfaces, but broadly sand on sand. For the high density, for the hybrid event beds, however, you've got these mud rich caps, which represent non reservoir um, parts um, intervals. And so if you've got a reservoir and you've identified hybrid event beds, you could be um, uh, basically trying to model permeability baffles and barriers to fluid flow in the subsurface. So that could be for a hydrocarbon reservoir, that could be for a CCS reservoir, whatever purpose you're using it for. And if you don't have a good model for hybrid event beds and their deposition and spatial distribution within the fan system, then you're going to run into problems later on in, 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 in dealing with that reservoir. So the reason why uh, those deposits are really important to understand, as I was touching on then, is because people use deep lacustrine drain systems in the subsurface for the, for the hydrocarbon industry, um, uh, certainly out in China. But they're also looking, and out in China, they're also looking to do CCS in those deposits as well. So there is, there is a good reason to fully understand them. So moving on. I put this into some spatial context. So we've got all of those flow types. We've got the lobe axis facies associations, um, where this arrow points towards the middle part of the fan, the, the lobe fringe in the in the lateral areas and the frontal areas, and um, grading out to the lobe distal fringe facies association in the, the edges of the fan system. So from that core data, we know where those, we know what those uh those facies associations look like, and we know the sedimentology and the processes, and we've we can see them in the in the geophysics. We can see them, and um, we can map them out and, and map the distributions. We can use both of those two sets of data to predict uh, where the where the more sand rich parts of the system are, and where the hybrid event beds might occur. And then when we put that into the wider context, it becomes even more complicated. So that's that's one system. So the sea line's one system. It's composed of three lobes. So the sea line 10, sea line 15, sea line 20 lobes. One system. That is that one sea line system in here. And along the North Falkland Basin, along the eastern margin alone, there's a whole series of five to ten fan systems that stack from north to south. So you've got a whole set of systems, some that go underneath one system, another one deposits on top, they interact at the margins, there's a whole range of multi-scalar heterogeneity and complexity to understand with them. So that's the coarse grain model dealt with. I've spent some time on that because I want you to be able to look at the following maps, but if you need to read that in certainly some more clarity, there is a paper on it you can go and find and spend as long as you want reading it. I haven't read it for a while. Um, so moving on, what we've been trying to do is because we understand the sea line system so well, and we know that it's it's composed of the, the flow types we've just been discussing, we've been trying to then think about what happens when it's not just a simple north-south trending um, uh, margin that they're being um, deposited, um, sorry, in, um, brought into the basin from, what happens when there's structure there? And so uh, essentially, what we've done is so we've got this map here it's a beautiful two-way time map of a series of faults along the margin uh, it's it's what we term as a breached uh, relay ramp and essentially there's there's some structure in here which uh, if you were if sediment gravity flow you might be trying to follow down to try and get into the basin into the deep into the basin deep for where the uh, deposits finally rest and we've, we've been thinking, right, if we map that basin structural geometry along the basin margin, what, what happens when we look at the with fan systems that enter the basin at this location? So some, some uh, similar stuff. Again, uh, the, the, the oranges and yellows are the, the sand-rich areas, and the blues are the more mud-rich areas. 
but you can see these beautiful systems that enter the basin at this margin area. So this is essentially that um, structure rotated through uh, around about, I don't know, 120 degrees, something like that, around, around like that. So you're looking at it from the east is that way on that on that one behind here, and on this one north is just in in, in the northern direction here. Essentially, coming down that breach rayli system, there's a whole series of of lobe deposits that extend out into the basin deep out in here. And something that you might recognise straight from this, I didn't mention it in the last one, um, but uh, it's quite an elongate system. And if you think back to the sea lion. It, most of those systems were quite elongate. I showed you the sinuous systems, the sinuous channels. Those channels followed the same strike as the overall plan form geometry of the of the of the turbidite fan system. But it was all elongate. These are all elongate and probably have a higher aspect ratio than the ones I've just shown you. Perhaps that's something that uh, is uh, quite typical for deep Lacustrine systems, perhaps. Remember, these are sand rich systems as well. And if you go to look at the deep marine literature, you'll see that most elongate systems in a deep marine setting are mud rich. Uh, and, and so we know from the sea lion area that these are actually sand rich systems, but they're showing these elongate profiles. Some, some things to think about as we continue through my examples. So, as I say, we've done similar things. We thought about how structure impacts upon uh, where these fan systems are coming in. Uh, the basin geometry might have an influence about on the plan form distributions of the fan systems. And we're building up a catalogue of what these deep Lacustrine fan systems look like, both in terms of sedimentology, but also seismic character. So I thought I'd just highlight that, that another one at this sort of scale that, before I move on. So. To labor the point again, we've come up with the idealized facies associations. We're actually building on, on top of all of that, and the hybrid event beds is, is the, the next topic that we're going to look at. And essentially, we've looked at uh, the hybrid event beds from sort of the broad scale, but now we've gone in and we've, I've spent some time cataloging this, the hybrid event beds and the sedimentary processes and placement associated with those deposits. And they're, they're quite quite complex units so this this basal unit in here this is the forerunning turbidity current these are the deposits of the forerunning turbidity current so these are the structureless to um, water escape structured uh, structureless sandstones with the uh, uh, normal grading towards the top of them in some examples with mud clasts uh, the, the the h2 unit sitting above it is a, a transitional unit they call it or a banded unit uh, and so that's, that represents the transition from the high density turbidity current at the front of the flow and the, um, the debris uh, flow that sits just at the rear of the, the event. So you've got a whole mixture of different um, flow types and rheologies going on in these, these hybrid event beds. They, are, they aren't simple at all, but as I said, they're very important to understand because this is mud, this, this gray color in here, this is this is this signifies really high mud content in these these units and this is just schematic but um if if uh one of these deposits let's say the the entire column here is it can be up to five six seven meters thick in some examples you can get hybrid event beds that are uh five meters of the total six meter thick package for example so they can be really significant units within a within a reservoir um, quite important to understand. So dive in and have a look at them. Uh, so the original models were made by Peter Horton et al. Um, sad to say it, that's almost 20 years ago. Uh, so essentially, I've just gone through that. They had a very similar sort of genetic deposit. Um, we've got the, the lower most uh, high density turbidity current, the HT unit. Um, and the, the overlying debritic unit in here. But as I show, showed in the last image, there's some more complexity within that debritic unit to explore. And seeing as this is a talk for the, for the Edinburgh Geological Society, I thought I'd show some actual core images. Wouldn't, that's really nice, isn't it? Um, so these are, these are examples of the hybrid event beds. And these are only, you know, there's probably 10 examples there in total. Uh, and uh, we've looked at hundreds of these bed types. 
And they, as you can see, they're really, really quite complex. They've, they've got these basal uh, clean sandstones at the bottom. And you can, you can convince yourself that we've got clean sandstones in most of those examples in there. And that, that overlying debritic unit that sits above it. So a lot of people like Horton and those in the marine systems, they would pick the base of, they might they pick the, the top of the H1 high density turbidite unit, just where that dotted line is in that example. And this from here up to the top would be the H3 uh, unit that sits above it. But if you start looking at these in detail, you can see there's some complexity in these systems. Uh, and so there's textural variation within the H3 unit. And those are separated by quite sharp contacts. And the sharp contacts that signify a change in sedimentary process of emplacement or, or uh, temporally separated flow deposits. So I've spent some time, I'm going to save you going through all of these examples, um, but just to highlight a few other things quickly, sorry. Um, I spent some time going through those examples. Some of the some of the contacts as well are are angular. Uh, you you're showing erosion between H3 subunits, and we've managed to break those all out uh, and subdivide it into H3A, H3B, and H3C, and try to link that to different sedimentary processes within the fan system. So all of those examples come from some more fan systems that I'm going to show you. The the sea lion uh, fan just in here is that grey polygon. To the south of there, the Casper fan, the, the Beverly and Zebedee fans to the south of that. And we've got core data from all of these, these units in here. So this is the, this is the examples of the core. We've got core from the Casper 10 lobe and the Casper 20 lobe, Beverly 10 just in here, uh, and some examples from Zebedee. And I'm gonna zip through those so you can see them. These ones are even more beautiful than the sea line. Uh, we've got Casper. Beautiful feature in here, two lobes to it, Casper 10, Casper 20. We've got no core from this location in here, but we do have some beautiful core from the, from the medial axial part of the fan and the distal part of the fan just in this location in here. If we color it up in a minute, I've, uh, I've, I've skipped a bit, sorry. <laughs> um, if we color it up, uh, the Casper fan uh, is, this, is this beautiful, uh, system in here. We've got the same facies associations picked out that we saw from the sea lion fan. So we understood the sea lion system. We moved down the margin uh, and did the same types of interpretation for Casper. We've picked out those uh, sinuous, low sinuosity to linear uh, channel systems feeding the, the distal located um, terminal lobes. We see those same terminal lobes that we saw in sea lion. So you start seeing features that are repeated. It's a set of processes that, set of features created by a set of processes that are happening within these deep crustrine systems time again, time and time and time again. Start to build up a catalog of those, those uh, deposits in terms of plan form geometries. Note the overall elongation of the system again. So if you look at, in particular, the, the, the more southerly lobe in here, just how elongate that system is. Aspect ratio of, I think it's a two or three in that one, um, really are quite elongate systems. Quite sandwich, quite elongate, tells you something about the sedimentary processes of emplacement. We've got some excellent data from that location. So this is a sedimentary log through that sinuous, um, seismic architecture just in here. The thickness, total thickness is around, well, I guess probably around 20, 30 meters thick, or maybe not even that. Um, but there's, uh, the, again, the, we go back to the sedimentary facies. We've got these, these sandstone units in here and they're amalgamated. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, you've got upwards of sort of around 10 amalgamated uh, event beds, all of these are individual high density turbidity current deposits stacked on top of each other. Clean, well sorted sandstones in this location in here. So you might have quite high permeability porosity zones. Um, towards the base of that uh, fan deposit, you see hybrid event beds. So we find them at the base of the, the system in here. We also see them interestingly, throughout the fan, the, the, the fan deposit as well, towards the top. So we see hybrid event beds appearing uh, towards the top of the lobe axis deposits 
and through to what I've termed the fan abandonment phase. So if you were trying to res model this um, in terms of if you were trying to produce a reservoir model, you'd have to take into account the location of these hybrid event beds and um, place them in, in context of where you think they're going to appear within the, the fan system. This is quite an interesting one because hybrid event beds for the deep marine setting have um, been um, more associated with fan fringe locations and fan, um, distal fan fringe locations. We see hybrid event beds in this example, um, maybe not the ones at the bottom, but certainly the ones towards the top, we see hybrid event beds being deposited in quite an axial, almost channelized location and preserved here as well. So something to think about in terms of comparing deep marine and deep lacustrine systems. Is there, a reason, is there a reason why you can form hybrid event beds in the abandonment phase of these, these fans? So if you jump to another location just in here, we've got some more core data. Again, quite sand rich amalgamated units, even in this distal location just in here from, the, from this lobe. Uh, note the thickness difference between the two. So in this one, we've got uh, essentially, I don't know, three or four meters, five, three or four or five meters of um, uh, deposit in this distal location in here. But the facies associations don't change that much. They, they get finer grained and thinner. You still got the high density turbidity currents getting from the feeder channels in the, in the east through to the distal parts of the basin in here. Uh, but essentially, you've got similar sedimentary processes in the distal part of the basin. The, I didn't draw attention to the scale of these systems either, just to get it into your head how far these flows are, are traveling in the basin. But this, this fan is, uh, it's probably around 10 to 15 kilometers in length. So these things are flowing a long way into the deep lake setting, transporting all of this sand into the deep parts of the basin. Elongate system. Again, another example, Zebedee fan. We're going to swiftly move to that one and just color it up twice so you can see. Slightly different plan form morphology. It's more of a fork geometry. Uh, you've got quite, it's still elongate, so it's still got a higher, high aspect ratio. You've got uh, evidence for interaction with topography on the, the bottom of the lake floor. But similar features like terminal mouth lobes in the distal parts of the basin. And some interesting features here, which we've got some lovely core data again from. So again, we've logged it in detail. We've spent the time applying those, that understanding from the sea line fan in terms of the FASIS associations. Uh, from, this is quite from a, quite a, a relatively axial location actually within the fan, but within an area of low seismic amplitude. I'll just skip back so you can believe me there. Can you see where it's quite low amplitude and surrounded by sets of linear to gently sinuous high amplitude areas. So we think this, I'm, I term these areas stranded lobe fringe areas, but you can see certainly that they're, they're quite dynamic in terms of the deposit. They're not those amalgamated high density turbidites where you've got quite clear amalgamation surfaces. You've got a whole suite of different flow types interacting in these, these areas. They've got an affinity for de the deposition and preservation of hybrid event beds. So trying to map a model out those stranded lobe fringe areas would be very important for a reservoir model. We see the hybrid event beds distributed throughout the reservoir unit. The, they, they would form baffles in this, this particular location and trying to predict their occurrence and thickness is, is quite difficult, but they, they do show order to them. So they've got certain stacking patterns. You can see that as you move from the mudstones, move upwards, the hybrid event beds become thicker. Um, and certainly the, the H1, the high density turbidite, it becomes thicker upwards. Um, and to some extent, the, the, the H3 Debrite unit also thickens and becomes texturally more diverse. So using those associations, we can start to try and work out how those hybrid event beds were formed in the early part of the fan. Were they part formed by erosion of the original substrate um, and mud inclusion into the flow, causing advanced segregation? Lots of um, potential for, for exploring those early hybrid event beds and how they form in these quite axial locations. Um, 
conscious of time. The Beverly fan. This was this is the this is the highlight one for me. Um, sometimes I just sit there and just look at it and just ponder what's going on with it. Sometimes it's such a beautiful system. You start building up that understanding. Okay, we've seen it in the sea lion. We've seen it in the Casper. We've seen it in the Zebedee. We've seen those terminal lo lobe um, features in the distal part of the fan time and time again, fed by these sinuous um, architectures in the seismic data that emanate from the feeder channels. The Beverly fan, this, this, this uh, zone just in here, the Beverly fan is intersected in the 1415-4Z well. And again, if you look at the scale on this, you're looking somewhere, I don't know, eight, eight nine, 10 kilometers out to the distal parts of the fan. Quite a distance it's traveled. We color it up, beautiful features. Um, this is my interpretation of it based on the understanding that we developed from sea lion through Casper, Beverly and Zebedee. And the core, similar, similar geometries, similar fan systems that we, um, sorry, sorry, similar facies associations that we saw in previous examples. The base of the Zebedee fan is about there. There is a little bit missing from the bottom because it didn't quite core the right through the bottom of it. But uh, if we assume the bottom's just here, a meter or so below, we can see the hybrid event beds again at the base of the fan system, sitting directly below the high density turbidite deposits. Hybrid event beds occurring in the intrafan areas and in, in, in these zones in here, all baffles and barriers to flow. Just understanding the lateral distribution of the hybrid event beds, the lateral distribution of the uh, uh, the high, high density turbidity currents that it's it's they're really complex dynamic systems and again high aspect ratio feeding these terminal low systems in here quite sand rich system but quite elongate and linear so just to sort of still those thoughts of where the hybrid event beds occur within within the, within the the fan systems most examples are from the medial distal parts of the fans. So you, you, you sort of see them in the, the, the more distal reaches of the fan system as those flows have been able to flow out and segregate and the hybrid event beds have formed as the flows have uh, tra um, traveled into the distal parts of the basin. Some are from the lower lobe fringe areas, but some are uh, from the lobe axis areas as well. So I said earlier that in marine systems, you see them just in the lobe fringe areas, whether that's the lateral lobe fringe or the frontal lobe fringe. But in the case of being for the, for the deep lacustrine systems, you, you see them in both lobe axis and lobe fringe areas. If that becomes problematic for reservoir models, perhaps, or, um, but as long as you can try and come up with models of ways to predict their occurrences within the fan system, which starts by mapping out the geometries, understanding the architectures and logging the, 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 the cores. That's how you start to think and understand where you might have hybrid event beds and where you might not have hybrid event beds. Uh, how, how much time have we got? Yeah, it's catching on. Right, um, I'm gonna just skip forward because I've realized that. I'm gonna move on to some other heterogeneities very, very quickly, five minutes on this one. So you've got the hybrid event beds, you've got the high density turbidity currents. It's all very complicated. You've got to spend lots of time understanding them and understanding the processes. We've got all these fan systems that are sand rich um, encased in mudstone. So they might be disconnected from each other in terms of space, um, spatially in terms of plan form distribution, but also in stratigraphically in the subsurface. On top of all of that, we have uh, post depositional heterogeneities in these deep lacustrine systems. And I'm just going to quickly show you these plastic injectite features. Plastic injectites um, essentially are uh, sand filled fractures. Let's, let's just start off with that as a simple, simple um, way of looking at them. Um, but they form from uh, pressure that builds up in the subsurface. Um, so essentially, you deposit a sandstone with porosity and um, with fluid in it. You, you can pack, you, um, put overburden on the top of it, that creates pressure, creates overpressures in the subsurface. And at a point, those pressures are released um, due to a breach of lithostatic pressure, essentially results in those sands remobilizing, those sands and waters remobilizing, intruding into the substrate, both upwards, outwards, and downwards, uh, forming these, these sand-filled fractures. 
that uh, um, and that's shown in this diagram in here. They can form cells, so just like igneous systems, they can form um, bedding parallel systems, uh, or they can form dikes um, of different geometries that form vertical conduits in the subsurface. What do they look like? Well, they look uh, something like this. These these small scale sandstone injectites in here. There is the scale. They're only small, but they have been intersected in a high density within within the areas around these fan systems. Some show visible porosity and are oil stained. Some are cemented. So there is a complex cementation story within these injectite systems themselves. But I think because you've seen oil staining, because you've got cementation in some examples, they do show that they are vertical and lateral um, corridors for fluid flow in the subsurface. They show that they have historically um, transported fluid between different parts of the stratigraphy. Um, the clastic cells, their porosity in some core plugs that we've got um, gets up to 18%, 50 millidarcy's permeability. Uh, the, the, that's quite reasonable in terms of um, parameters for um, reservoir units. Um, and in, in places like the North Sea, they do form the key um, reservoir reservoirs on some of the oil discoveries out there. But these are much smaller scale features that we're looking at in these deep Lacustrine systems. Um, and so we've mapped those out in terms of the locations within around the sea line fan. We see them, um, these are the intensities within these core locations. We see them in the more distal parts of the fan system out in here, but they do occur throughout the, the fan in the cores that we've got in quite high densities. I mean, in this location in here, there's a 30 meter thick section of um, core. There's 75 features in there. Um, so you're thinking 75 of these injectites across the 30 meter section. If we've intersected them in a six inch wide core barrel, how laterally continuous are they? They must be. They must be quite dense. If you're if you're intersecting them vertically like this, you must be finding them laterally too as well, away from the the the, uh, the core area. Quite important things to consider. I'm just drumming home now just how continuous they are. We see in between the different fan units, we've got the, the both sills and dikes. So the blues are dikes and the reds are sills. So we've mapped out their character in quite some detail between the reservoir units. We understand where they form above and below these fan systems. And importantly, in areas where they may or may not connect um, uh, depositional units. So for example, between the sea line 10 unit and Casper here, You've got high intensities of sills, sill dominated units in, in, in between those two intervals in here with some dikes connecting the sills. So could they form um, vertical uh, fluid transmissibility corridors in the subsurface between these fan systems? Uh, we've got their, their distribution in relation to all of the core data, all of the FASIS logs that we've understood and, and produced and been going over in this talk. I've just thought I'd just show this one. This one for me shows the complexity in the subsurface. It shows all of the fan systems with all of the FASIS associations that we've looked at and understood. It shows all of the injectites in between those features and the character of those injectites. And this is this is uh, this is what drives me forward for looking at these things in in deep Lacustrine systems. The, the the detail, the amazing set of processes that can be found. The, the understanding that can be gained from it. It's just, it's, it's kept me on it for 11 years now. And counting. And there's plenty more to do. But I was just showing you the, the, the level of in, um, uh, uh, detail that we've gone into to try and characterize these systems. So this is more of a stand back and think about it sort of thing. We, we're thinking about um, what causes the, the injection event May it might be related to buildup of pressure, um, which may be related to a whole range of things. It can just be overburden and building up poor water pressures. It, um, there's a whole range of ways of um, building up that pressure. Um, uh, but we're thinking about what happened. What's what's the uh, cause for the injection? Um, trying to think about maybe does that indicate some kind of uh, early hydrocarbon generation in the basin? Um, very fast, very rapid um, migration of hydrocarbon into the into the reservoir areas, which 
builds up pressure very quickly and causes the, the seals to fracture and the injections to happen around these fan systems. I'm trying to think about it on the very broad scale of why we've got the injectites between certain different fan units and where they were sourced from and what that might say about the, the basin scale processes. But essentially trying to relate these small scale features, these 10 centimeter scale features to the big scale basin scale um, geology of the North Falcon Basin. Um, and finally, just uh, want to show you a noddy sort of diagram of how we see that subsurface, quite a complex subsurface to understand a map, but thank God there's some great data to have been looked at. Uh, and that one's just to show the range of porosity and permeability um, that the classic injectites uh, do have. I thought it was quite important just to quickly show that it's not just geofantasy, that we've got some empirical information on these systems. Um, and if you look at some of the dikes and sills that we just happen to have data from, um, we haven't gone through and systematically sampled all of them. This is just the ones that happen to have been sampled in a routine core analysis. We've got really great uh, uh, porosities in here, somewhere around 20 mark um, and, and permeabilities uh, around is that 100, 100 milli Darcy in there. There, there really are um, potential conduits for fluid flow in the subsurface. And sometimes the small scale features get overlooked because they're just small scale features. But actually, if you think about how, how intensely um, intersected they are in, the, in these particular locations, and then think about the porosity and permeability of each of those small um, injectites collectively, they build up to quite a, um, uh, an effective uh, fluid flow uh, pathway. So that again is published in there and you can go and marvel at all of the wonder in there. Finally, to summarize and conclude, um, before I get onto those points, I've shown you lots. I've shown you lots and it's, it's um, been a bit chaotic in some ways, but in other ways, I hope I've shown you that deep lacustrine systems are complex and quite interesting um, systems to try and understand. Um, from the deep lacustrine versus deep marine sort of comparison, we, I'm strongly pushing that the, the elongation is a, a, a function of being in a deep lacustrine setting, and that might be to do with um, the, the flow types entering the basin and the waters within the basin. It might be to do with um, the amount of sand being transported into the basin, the connection to the in-draining river systems, uh, and a whole raft of other reasons why you've got that elongation of, of, of the fan systems. It's the size as well. It's quite a thick, difficult thing to compare the two. So you've got in the deep marine setting, a lot of the sand rich systems are typically a lot larger than these examples that we see in the deep lacustrine setting. Um, but you still see all of these, the, the, the complexity in terms of facies associations and sedimentary processes of emplacement. So what we're doing now is trying to compare all of these attributes um, from these examples in the deep lake setting, all of the architectures, all of, all of that, and trying to come up with a, a scheme for deep lacustrine systems that incorporates all of these processes, um, controls on deposition, and um, something that can hopefully be used by all of these researchers now working on deep lacustrine systems in, in all of the other continents across the globe. So, and to, because the problem is that a lot of people are applying deep marine classification systems and understanding directly to deep lake, said, lake deposits. And it doesn't always work and sometimes and most often does uh, completely falls apart. So other than that ramble, um, we'll go through these. Deep lacustrine turbidite fan systems are composed of complex heterogeneous successions, yet they are quite predictable in character and distribution. We've mapped them out. We've, I've built up an understanding of how they are. We can predict where the sand rich parts are. We have some understanding of where the hybrid event beds are. We know that there's other heterogeneities out there that um, exist between the fan systems that might connect them. We can start to understand and predict uh, the whole system just in, in general, but also these examples provide good examples for other basins worldwide. Um, deep lacustrine fans are composed of high density turbidites, low density turbidites, hybrid event beds in, in, in the uh, core data that we've got, uh, just like marine settings, but maybe there's different controls on those, those uh, flow types and uh, um, from the wider context. 
Hybrid event beds are complex deposits formed as a result of flow transformation, uh, segregation uh, from uh, forerunning turbidity current and a rearward debris flow. But spatially and temporally, that's quite a complex uh, thing to understand. And uh, perhaps a bit more research needs to be done in that for the deep Lacoste train systems in particular. Um, and so the original models produced in deep marine settings where you've got uh, the, the Debrite unit, the H3 unit, it's, it's just one unit. It has been subdivided in a few examples, but we can see that in the deep lake setting, we've definitely got discrete units within that H3 unit. It's discrete flow events within that H3 Debrite. It's complex. It's um, longitudinally segregated, maybe more than one time. Um, is that because of the, the we're in a deep lake setting? You're thinking about clays, maybe there's some influence of salinity on clay flo flocculation in these flow types. There's a whole, other, whole um, road to travel on, on that one, exploring why these H3 units are, are complex and texturally complex and lithologically quite complex. And finally, clastic injectites uh, provide an additional heterogeneity in deep lacustrine basins, which needs to be recorded, characterized and modeled Mix my, uh, modeled when considering hydrocarbon exploration and oil field development planning, but also in any place that uses these deposits for other things like CCS um, and, and any other use of uh, deep lacoste drying subsurface. Um, and I think that it's important that all of this learning that's been done around this for, for the dark arts actually gets applied to, to future looking um, applied reasons and, and we need to use that understanding to um, make a good job of uh, reservoir models for those purposes and it, this should all be uh, useful and made use of so with that ramble uh, I will say thank you very much and uh, any questions